We read this morning from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. And while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. The wheat sprouted and formed heads. Then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came and said, you didn't sow good seed in the field. Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he said. Shall we go and pull them up? No, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, collect the weeds, tie them in bunches to be burned, Get, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. He left the crowd and went into the house. But his disciples came to him. Tell us of the parable of the weeds in the field. Jesus said, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The harvesters are the angels. As weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels. They will weed out his kingdom, everything that causes sin, and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace, where there will be weeping, weeping and gnashing of teeth. The righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. So he who has ears, let him hear. The word from the Lord in the house of the Lord. Boy, I love it when they give you a, a parable and then explain it and I don't have to. More importantly, probably, is the letter that Paul wrote to the church at Rome where he said, unless you can separate yourself from the ways of the world and live in the ways of God and, and the Son, you're lost. You're going to be tied up and burned before the harvest. Not a nice thing to say about anybody. But that's what he was trying to tell. A church that was struggling to stay alive individuals who were struggling to stay alive. For if they were caught and convicted of being a, a Christian, they were put to death. When a Christian would meet another person who might, he might know or he might not know, he took his foot and he drew a semicircle or an arc like that. And if the other one was a Christian and saw what he'd done, he would finish the outline of the fish. That was their secret signal. That's how they identified each other. That's how they could go down the street, have a conversation with someone, and determine whether or not they believed in Christ. If you were caught doing it, you got put to death. It's a pretty simple situation. Uh, you open a prayer book and they put you to death. You read the Bible, they put you, of course they didn't have a Bible to read, so that's a lousy uh, example. They existed encouraged by the word of a man who had been touched in his life by Christ. For this is Paul. This is Saul who used to put Christians to death. This is the guy who spent his, his life enforcing the law. The law of the church. The law of Moses. Remember his, he was on the way to Damascus and was struck down on the road and rendered blind, deaf, and dumb. He was taken into the closest town, Samaria, and taken to the home of a Christian who said, I don't want him in my house. But the angel came to him and said, yeah, let him in and call for the prophet. That's when he was enlightened. It was when he was given his voice back. It was when he was given his sight back so that he could see clearly the benefits of being one with Christ. Now here he is writing a letter to a church that's struggling to stay alive. 
It wasn't a letter from a long distance away because he was in a Roman prison. And he was writing encouraging words to those who were facing the Roman might every day of their life. I'm not sure I have the stamina to be imprisoned, to be under guard, and to write encouraging words at that time. Maybe I'm not that big an optimist. I would hope so. Isn't it? We, for, for a minute the other night, I was a billionaire because the first number was mine. <laughs> also, the last number that was mine. No, just for a moment, I was a billionaire and I already, already had my spending plans. And then we got the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. And also the Powerball. I really had counted on that. No, I'm kidding now. If we, if we count on that kind of good fortune to determine our lives, we're doomed to be wrong 283,967,610 times because the odds are 111 one out of that 111 on the end. So we're not going to win it. You, you get in it so you get something to do for a minute and a half. <coughs> I wanted to quit watching when I got the first number. And then I could hope till the next day. <coughs> hope is what you have for the things that you think you need that you don't have. If you possess it, you don't have to hope for it. If you possess it, you have it. Excuse me. <coughs> I better. I got a tickle today. Don't want to call. <clears throat> That's better, I think. Hope is what, it, what we exist with. Hope is what brightens every day. I don't know what you hoped for this morning when you got up. I hoped somebody would show up. <laughs> and somebody did. So my, I don't have to hope for it anymore. Because I have reality. Hope separates us from the reality of what the world is. It ho separates us from the reality of what we have to face in our everyday life. The, the part of our life that Christ isn't embedded in. And if we can't, if we can't separate reality from hope, then we're going to get lost in the translation. translation. Paul wrote, if you have hope, that's all you need. Because you can, you can count on Christ to be there. And if you've learned to hope on his love, learned to hope on his being in your life, then it becomes a reality. And your hope isn't, isn't just hope, but it's a reality. The parable is simple. The problem is if you go out into an immature field, everything is green. And unless you've taught people how to separate the crop from the weeds, they will destroy part of your crop. My brother used to raise tomatoes for the fresh market. And they had laborers who would go into the field to pick it. And the way they determined how to, which tomatoes to pick and which ones not, they painted their thumbs with the color tomato they wanted. So they had only to look at the tomato in their thumb to know that that, was the, that one was ripe for them. If it was greener than that and they harvested it, it would be thrown away. If it was redder than that, when they picked it, it would probably squish in their hand. So. But that was, simply, that was a means of teaching people what was next, what was right, what was proper. And the farmer could hope 
that they would pick a good crop of tomatoes and they wouldn't get docked at market because some of them, or a significant percentage of them, were not market ready. That was easy. You could separate the good from the bad. You obviously knew the ones that were black weren't any good anymore. And the ones that were green weren't ready. What a way it was to train. How am I going to teach you to pick the right tomatoes? I'm going to paint your thumb. So when you pick, there it is. Oh, it matches. That's easy. But when you're dealing with greens and all they're all green, and the other thing is that in pulling up a weed, you might also pull up several of the good plants around it. And Jesus simply saying to the, the parable says, you will be separated in the end. It's not our job to separate the wheat from the weeds. Not our job. Our job is to grow the best field, the best possible field we can, have the best crop we can. But when it comes to the ultimate selection, God will make it at the end. Are you to be burned in the pile of fire and gnashing of teeth and wailing? No, I, I don't think so. Because he has loved us enough to give himself so that if we live a life not this exemplary, but a life that is respectable, respectful, and respective. Then you, you get to go to the harvest, not to the burn bin. Such a, such a simple, and yet such a deep uh, parable that Christ would use something that simple to direct his his the disciples' attention, not on today, but on the end. At that time, you know, these things were, were written by people who had experienced Christ or had experienced someone who had experienced Christ. It's a very simple time for them. They needed an explanation that they could understand. We've got 2,000 years of history and we don't understand how many of you understand all the parables in the Bible? Yeah. I've looked at this one a lot of times and it's got to be the most simple explanation to a parable and yet it's very, very deep because it's a parable about each one of us in our relationship with God. It's a parable about living a life that is respectable, respective, on God. Not our job, and we need to understand that. It's not our job to, job to judge the alive. It's not our job to judge the dead. God will take care of all the judging. He asks us to take care of all the loving. Wait, wait, wait is what the the man said to his servants, just wait, there's no hurry. God will decide in good time. But in the meantime, raise the best crop you can. Do the best job you can. There is no perfect diagram, no perfect, now we're getting into computer, no perfect menu on reaching the end time that you want, where you want it to be. You have to do the best you can. Remember last week, Paul's message, I find myself, I do the things I don't want to do and the things I want to do, I don't. We're all going to face those kinds of days. But that doesn't put us in the weed pile. That doesn't put us in the burn pile. That puts us in the live pile. And when it's time, God will make his judgments. God will decide. God will figure it out. He asks you to believe, which gives you hope for eternity. You'll never know that reality until it happens. We can, we, we can buy another lottery ticket. And for an instant, I can be a billionaire. 
Sometimes I don't even get the first number. I only buy one when it's over a billion, over five hundred million dollars. So I'm a practical person. If the odds are two hundred eighty-three million to one against me. There's no point in buying that ticket. But when it's five hundred million, you know, what would you do with a billion dollars? What would you do with one day in heaven? It's way, way more valuable than the billion dollar ticket. Live like it's the best day of your life. Live like there is a tomorrow. Live in the love of God. Amen.